moved with the steering wheel to the point where the car was going. Tucker is played in the movie by Jeff Bridges, who enthusiastically describes his dream to his family. Gallup took a poll last week to find out what Americans want most when the war is over. 87% of the people in this country said the first thing they want is a new car. Now, which do you think the public would rather buy? The same old models Detroit has been giving us before the war, or... <clears throat> the car of tomorrow. Today. Whoa! At first, things go well as Tucker finds a surplus war industries plant in Chicago to build his car. The biggest damn plant in the whole world, and we're the ones who got it. Oh, that's wonderful. All we need now is $15 million in a car. Oh, that's... Tucker gets in trouble after Detroit's big three use their political clout to shut him down. Tucker, don't go home. There's two police cars waiting for you. They're going to arrest you. Don't go home. And this you won't believe. Outside the police station, maybe there's 50. A hundred reporters, photographers, newsreels even. They're going to drag you out with leg irons. The movie ends with Tucker's defense of himself at his jury trial for fraud. But a big business closes the door on the little guy with a new idea. We're not only closing the door on progress, but we're sabotaging everything that we fought for. Everything that the country stands for. And one day we're going to find ourselves at the bottom of the heap instead of King of the Hill, having no idea how we got there, buying our radios and our cars from our former enemies. <laughs> I don't believe that's going to happen. I can't believe it, because if I ever stop believing in the plain old common horse sense of the American people, there's no way I could get out of bed in the morning. And we learn the whole heartbreaking story of how Tucker really did deliver on his promise to deliver 50 of these cars, 46 of which are still on the road, but nevertheless was never able to keep going because the big three didn't want that competition. There was a lot I enjoyed about Tucker, and especially the look of those sleek and handsome old classic automobiles. But the movie as a whole was a disappointment. Francis Coppola, who usually pumps so much energy into his films, never really convinced me this time that he knew why he was really making this one. The movie is not a detailed examination of the automobile's history, nor does it have much psychological insight into Tucker, the man. He remains just kind of a cheerful enigma. Nor does it ever really even make the conspiracy against Tucker very exciting. It's all kind of sad and weary. It's been said that Tucker is a somewhat autobiographical film for Coppola. It's a movie about a visionary with a large family and devoted friends and grandiose plans that are shot down by the establishment, and it's impossible not to see the parallels with Coppola's own attempts to run his own Hollywood studio. Maybe that's the problem with the film. Tucker was too close to Coppola for Coppola to see him clearly, and the fate of his dreams was too depressing to inspire much energy. Well, I don't know. That's speculation, but I would agree with you that the film had a disappointment quality for me. I was caught up as the film progressed, and he developed his car, and Coppola shoots in a very exciting, fluid way, breaking through some walls and making some leaps in uh, editing mm -hmm. that are very exciting. And so we get caught up visually, as well as in the story pacing, with the development of the car. However, you pick on two major flaws. One, we don't know who Preston Tucker is. Mm -hmm. We don't know who he is, other than the fact that he wants to build a car. There should have been more private time with him and who this guy is, rather than just what he wants to build. And second, the film is really a letdown, because we know that the big three are going to crush him. It's obvious. It's, they're sinister. We know that the Tucker automobile did not, it does not exist today. It did not become a hit. And so the uh, surprise element of the film is la uh, totally lacking, and we're shut down. So well, I it's guess it's a beautiful we, film. It is. I didn't mind. I didn't mind watching it. But when the Coppola name is there, you expect he a little makes, bit more. He makes a film. He cannot make a film that is not compelling to watch. Visually. But at the, yeah, to watch visually, but at the same time, this time he did not make a film no. that was compelling. And I think, the, I think the real thing is, who is Tucker? I don't know. 
Our next film is an awful comedy called Vibes, which is a ripoff of the wonderful comic adventure Romancing the Stone. This time with the would-be comic overlay of a couple of lead characters being psychics in search of a South American city of gold. The psychics are played by Cindy Lauper, who gets a message from a girlfriend from the next world, and Jeff Goldblum, who can touch things and tell what's happened to them and where they've been. I can take an object and um, tell you where it's been, who's come in contact with it. Any money in that? Doll. Ketis. No, not directly. I found both the characters and the performances boring, and the same holds true for the usually likable Peter Falk playing a con man who tries to use Cindy Lauper's powers for his personal gain. Why'd you break into my apartment? Because I was afraid to stand in a hallway carrying what I'm carrying. Yeah? $50,000. And it's all yours if you do a job for me. It's so obvious to read what Falk is up to. Of course, Jeff Goldblum goes along for the ride, and he slowly gets the idea, very slowly gets the idea, that Falk <laughs> is a faker. This isn't your son's shirt. Sure it is. No. This shirt's only been worn by one man, an older man, much too old to be your son. Did I say my son? No. I'm sorry. I'm his son. It's my father that's missing. Harry Senior. Only a few jokes work, and that's stunning, because Falk and Goldblum are obviously talented actors who have pleased us so many times, but not here. The storyline is obvious, the script is virtually without laughs, and the echo of a much better similar film, Romancing the Stone, is always with us while we were watching Vibes, a film that I really think can be described as quite awful. I wouldn't say quite awful. I would say very awful. You see, oh. there's a slight distinction there. This movie is bad, and yep. the sad thing about it is, the setup, the first five or ten minutes, five minutes, are promising. Where they have all of these yes. psychics who can do different things. Goldblum has certain skills. Cindy Lauper has skills. Other guys have There's skills. There's this Teutonic guy. And if they had stayed in the psychic lab and yes. investigated the comic possibilities yes. of different people, all of them weirdos who have different kinds of psychic talents, might have been fun. The, everything that happens in South America is utterly. It's I'm going to say ludicrous, but that makes it sound like fun. It's just utterly a waste it's of time. It's romancing the stone. I mean, it is, there, yeah. I mean, is there such a thing as theft? That's theft. Coming up next, Tom Cruise and Brian Brown in Cocktail, the story of a bartender who mixes, stirs, and shakes his way to the top. Now, what was it that you ordered? A martini. What's in that? Well, and this is the saga of a handsome young Manhattan bartender played by Tom Cruise. Fresh out of the service, he gets a job bartending in a slick Upper East Side saloon where he comes immediately under the influence of a veteran bartender and philosopher played by Brian Brown. Brown teaches him the ropes, which include never pouring too much of a heavy drink, develop a routine, work the crowd, collect tips, keep your eyes open for a rich chick who can support you, and give you money to open your own bar. That's the important one. Here's one of the movie's best sequences as the two bartenders do their act together. One, two, three, go! With that choreography, I doubt if they can pour very many drinks in an hour, but at least it's fun to watch. You may remember Brian Brown there from FX, one of the big recent video hits. The two friends are so successful, they move to an exclusive private disco where Tom Cruise's big brown eyes attract a lot of fans. You gotta let me take a picture. What for? When you're a big celebrity, I'll put you in Rolling Stone magazine. My protege. I discovered you. Ah, that's great. Can you move aside, though? I can't fit you both in. Excuse me. <laughs> Later, working as a bartender in Jamaica, Cruise stopped playing the field long enough to develop a sincere love for Elizabeth Shue. But then he leaves her for a rich woman, and when he comes back to New York to apologize, she's hard to convince. Do you say you'd like to see the specials, sir? I'd like to see the specials. Look, are we even waiting? Today's specials are meatloaf mozzarella, chicken a la king, Suggesting ketchup. On the surface, at least, a cocktail is a slick entertainment with some colorful locations. It moves well, it has great dialogue moments, and Tom Cruise and especially Brian Brown create an interesting relationship. The kid who takes advice from a veteran who realizes that he doesn't have very much good advice to give. Their performances are good, but the movie milks all kinds of serious questions for whatever entertainment value they have, and then forgets all about them. For example, the movie makes a big deal of how Cruz is looking for a rich chick. 
So Elizabeth Shue doesn't reveal that she's a rich chick. Then her father throws the couple out and tells them they're on their own. And Cruz, who has now cured himself of this search, sounds real noble when he says that's just fine with him. But then we find out that within a few months, he owns his own fancy New York saloon. Well, you don't open one of those for peanuts. So that means that Cruz did take money. The movie just ignores that by turning up the rock and roll on the final freeze frame. Cocktail is a brainless movie with pretensions. I would have liked it more if it had possessed the courage to be just a silly love story. Well, here's what I think what's wrong with the movie, and that is the love story. I thought that the most interesting part of the film, and I guess you did too, was the opening, the relationship of those two men. Yes. If you had taken the tutor who knows less than he thinks and the young impressionable man and followed them through the city of New York as they went through some kind of pyramid scheme together, together, make them the heart of the movie, mm -hmm. then you would have had a fascinating film, similar to The Color of Money, in terms of the relationship of tutor to pupil, with also with Tom Cruise. But the love story is totally ridiculous. I mean, it's just absolutely predictable. You know who he's going to end up with. We know that from right from the beginning. And we know that he's going to be tempted and thrown and come back with her. The love story is, is not in character and well, sync with the first part of the film. I was just suggesting that if they had had, had a silly love story, it would have been better than all of their pretensions. Well, but I agree with your, you know, prescription for the relationship between that's the, the two. Key. That's what's exciting. Thing that bothers me. It's hard to keep yourself from thinking during these movies. And that's what you have to do sometimes because you have to forget that these people are drunk in every scene, but they never have any problem with alcoholism, and they sleep with everybody they well, come across, and they never think about age. So well, these people are apparently somehow an exception to the rule that governs everybody well, else. Except in town. No, there are scenes where Cruz knocks over some sculptures twice. So, yeah, something against sculptures. When he gets bombed, he knocks over a sculpture. Coming up next, a movie called Clean and Sober, starring Michael Keaton as a <laughs> drug abuser on the run, trying to save his neck and maybe change his life. Fine! You want me out of here? I'm out of here! I'm gone! It's called Clean and Sober, and it's one of many new films out now trying to deal with the problem of substance abuse, be it drugs or alcohol. Michael Keaton, known for his breezy roles, plays it serious this time as a young man addicted to cocaine and to booze, and he embezzles $92,000 because of his habit. What's more, a girl he spent the night with dies of an overdose at the beginning of the film, and Keaton is suddenly on the run. He finds a safe house by checking into a drug rehab clinic. Um, I heard about the program, and it sounds really good to me. I just want to make sure I understand the deal as far as the uh, confidentiality aspect is concerned. Yes, well, the program is completely confidential. So no one would have to know I was in here. Keaton's flip attitude is brought up short by Morgan Freeman, playing a street-smart drug counselor, a former addict himself. You don't even know you got a problem, do you? You know how long you've been straight, man? Twelve days. They're very good together. That's a powerful scene, a quiet scene. There's a love story angle to this film as Keaton finds a woman he likes at the clinic, but actress Kathy Baker spots him as just a guy on the make. Listen, I just want you to know, you know, if uh, sleeping alone starts to get you down. You know what I mean? I mean, sometimes... <laughs> I just know how tough it can be to have to sleep alone. I'll bet you do. There's a lot to like about Clean and Sober. The film does not glamorize drug use. Keaton does a convincing job of playing a con man who is also conning himself about his addiction. Morgan Freeman, who got that Oscar nominee for playing a pimp in Street Smart, is rock solid again as the counselor. And the ever-reliable character actor M. Emmett Walsh is terrific as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous who tries to take Keaton under his wing. I've named every major member in the cast. They and the knowing script by Todd Carroll do open her eyes a bit to the widespread problem of not just drug addiction, but the equally difficult problem of self-rehabilitation. There have been a lot of hackney movies made about this issue. Clean and Sober, I think, is an honest, solid treatment of the subject. I agree with you, Gene, and what I liked best about it was that it was not just some kind of a noble sermon or some right. kind of preaching about how bad drugs are and how noble Michael Keaton is. Here's a guy who does almost everything wrong. Correct. He's addicted not only to cocaine, but he's also addicted to lying. Mm -hmm. And Kathy Baker, the girl that he meets in the cocaine and booze uh, rehabilitation place, is addicted not only to drugs, but also 
she's got into a re an addictive relationship. So it's a movie uh, that about addictive her. personalities. And of course, the worst thing these two people could do would be to fall in love with each other, which is going to screw up both of their recoveries, and almost does. So that the movie is very realistic in showing that it's not just a case of you check into Betty Ford and then the sun rises the next day, yeah. but that it takes honesty and it takes an ability to admit that you have a problem and that you do need help. What I was particularly impressed with was the work of Michael Keaton. Now here, mm -hmm. it, we have seen Jane Fonda try and play an alcoholic in uh, her film, and I can't come up with the name of it, but it doesn't matter because the film wasn't that good. The Morning After. The morning After. Mike, that was played almost as a thriller. It was like halfway into it. Mm -hmm. Michael Keaton does a very good... Here's a guy who is, you know, a Mr. Jolly in most of his films. Mm -hmm. From the first moment that we see him in bed, hung over, and we've seen Michael Fox try and play a, a drug addict in Bright Lights, Big City, not as well. Michael Keaton, an excellent job in this role. Michael Keaton and everybody else in the movie, too. I yeah. mean, it's a, it's, it's a lot of good performances. I making think very it impressive. As far as this subject is concerned, maybe the best movie I've seen on it. Coming well, up next, oh, sorry. Sid and Nancy, I think, is also an excellent subject on the on abuse of drugs. Sid and Nancy never quite got to the rehab clinic, of course. No. Yeah. Coming up next, after Manhattan bars and Philadelphia cocaine abusers, Baghdad Cafe, a little bit more simple place in which a German woman tries to put a little life into a bar in the California desert. Magic. It's named Baghdad Cafe, and this is an offbeat and oddly infectious comedy that takes place in a desolate and almost forgotten truck stop at the edge of the Mojave Desert. The movie starts when a German woman is ditched there by her husband in the middle of the desert, and in desperation, she checks uh, into the nearest yeah. motel. She doesn't exactly get a warm welcome. You've got to carry your suitcase yourself. We ain't no grand hotel. Before long, the woman has become part of the little family at that truck stop, including a legendary local character played by the equally legendary Jack Palance. Allow me to introduce myself. Rudy Cox. How do you do? I'm from Hollywood. That's Marianne Sagebrecht as the woman from Germany. Eventually she performs a transformation in the cafe, enlisting the owner in a magic show that has the customers lined up outside. 37 trucks? was CCH Pounder as the owner of the cafe there. I know that I enjoyed this movie while I was watching it, mostly because it provided me with a lot of unusual people and gave me absolutely no idea of what they were going to do with themselves or do with their cafe. But after the movie was over, I sat there looking at the screen and asking myself, what was that all about? The answer, I think, is that maybe it wasn't about much of anything, and maybe that's okay. You have to accept that this cafe is there, and the people in it are kind of stagnating, and into their lives comes this woman who is either from Germany or maybe from the moon, and things get shaken up a lot. I'm not sure, but I think that was enough. I it don't think the movie was about much more. It was not enough for me. Uh, the only character that really caught my attention was Jack Palance, and it's because it was such a departure for Jack Palance. I mean, and I thought he was fascinating. The rest of the thing, I think you've described something that is, is, that is boring. I have seen th that locale used more effectively by foreign directors. I mean, Paris, Texas is a more interesting use of visually of the same area of the country. I really got no energy from the film, only Palance interested. You weren't interested even in the fact that these people were totally unlike any other people I know. seen in a movie Oh, before. Roger, I know what you're saying. I mean, I, I will take this crew over cookie-cutter Hollywood types any day, mm -hmm. but I want to see the director do something with him, and I don't feel that that would happen. Now let's recap our reactions to the movies on this show. Two disappointed thumbs down for Tucker, a great film to look at, but one that leaves its central character a mystery. Two thumbs down, way down for Vibes. Remember this rotten film when you're compiling your list of the worst movies of 1988. I know I will. Two thumbs down also for Cocktail, a film that sacrifices a potentially exciting relationship between Tom Cruise and Brian Brown in favor of a standard love story. Two thumbs up, however, for Clean and Sober, one of the finest films ever to treat the subject of drug abuse and alcohol abuse. And finally, a split vote on Baghdad Cafe, a film I thought lacked energy, but Roger found strangely absorbing. So obviously, it is Michael Keaton's wonderful performance 
the whole ensemble performance work in Clean and Sober. Well, when you talk about the ensemble work, we know that Michael Keaton, Morgan Freeman, and Emma Walsh are great actors. We've seen them be yes. great before. They're great again this time. I was thinking, though, about Kathy Baker in yes. this film, and you remember she was the prostitute yes. in Street Smart. I don't know who she is or where she no, comes I, from, I but in both of those movies, really good work. And as soon as she hit the camera, too. I mean, I mean, he yeah. picks her out, but I pick her out for another reason. I want to watch what's going to happen yeah, to her. So that's Clean and Sober, that's mark the film of a good actress. That's it for this week. Next week, a personal selection by Gene and myself of four Hollywood actors who we think are really very good and don't get nearly as much attention as they deserve. We're going to take a look at the film careers of Barbara Hershey, Albert Brooks, Teresa Russell, and Charles Grodin. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed. Thank you.